Those are all the encryption algorithms that we're going to talk about. There are others. There's a type of encryption referred to as uh, elliptic curve cryptography. And we're going to stop there with uh, PGP, AES, and RSA. Hash functions, what are those all about? So a hash function maps a message of arbitrary length into a fixed number of bits, producing a hash value. Sometimes it's known as a message digest, or sometimes it's just called the digest. Good, in quotes, cryptographic hash functions have five properties. They're deterministic. The same input produces the same output every single time. And it's quick to compute. It's computationally inexpensive to take the message and produce the digest. It is impractical to determine a message from the hash value. Notice I didn't say impossible. It's very difficult computationally. It takes a lot of compute power to take a hash value and run the hash algorithm backwards to try to produce the original message. This is why they're cool. This is why they're good. This is why we use them. And it gives rise to this notion of uh, being a one-way function. So you take this message, you feed it into a hash function, you get this digest out. Very hard to go the other direction. Computationally expensive. Four, a small change in the input results in a large change in the output. So I want to make a comment about AES algorithm also. On average, um, if you flip one, if you take a data of 16 bytes of data and feed it into the AES algorithm and look at the ciphertext, and then you flip one bit of that 16 bytes and feed it into the AES algorithm and compare the two ciphertext, on average, about 50% of the bits flip in the second set of ciphertext, approximately. And it's also impractical to find two messages that map to the same hash value. Hash functions can be used to check the integrity of data transmission. This is one of their primary uses. It can also be used to store passwords. So in this little cartoon example, imagine there's a website somewhere, and you have a username, and this is the character string you chose for your password. So previously, this password, when you set up your account, was run through a hashing algorithm, and it produced F1324578 and is stored in this password table. So this is a list of digests of the user's passwords for all the users. And the username indexes into the password table. So you enter your username, and you enter your password. The system uses your username as an index into this table, pulls out the hashed value of the password, and takes the password you, that you set up when you set up your account, and then takes the password you just typed into the website, hashes it, and compares them. To, and if they're the same, then you're allowed access. If they're not the same, then you get rejected. Also, just be aware that there's a family of hash functions as per FIPS 180-4. FIPS is a United States Federal Information Processing Specification. Oh, I should have looked that up first. <laughs> I think that's what it stands for, Federal Information Processing Specification 180-4. And later uh, in this set of slide decks, probably we'll get to it uh, next week, uh, we'll go look at some of those FIPS publications, and there's quite a few of them out there. These hash functions that are listed in the specification are well st studied, and we have not spotted a problem. We, the uh, cryptographic good guys, uh, have not spotted a problem with them yet. So those would be, if you're looking for a good cryptographic hash function, uh, use one of the specifications in that FIPS, one of those algorithms in the FIPS specification. Remember I said security is never ever 100%. It's only so good. Um, we believe it to be, these things to be secure until we, someone figures out a way to prove that it's not secure. Are there any weaknesses with this scheme? Um, can be. There's a, a type of attack known as a, a dictionary attack. And 
The idea behind the dictionary attack is an adversary is able to steal this password table and has these values. And then what they do is they try and enter uh, passwords that map to one of the values in the, in the table. And they can then later use that to log in to your account. So how would they get this? They might have to be granted physical access to the server room and is able to log on and stick a flash disk in the server and, or a flash drive in the server, whatever, and, and download it. Um, and like Snowden, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure how he got his data, but uh, he was able to pull a bunch of information off because he had physical access to sensitive equipment. Message authentication codes. These are like hashes, um, but they're a little more than has, uh, hashes. So it accepts as an input a secret key or a key. Ideally, you want to keep your key secret. Uh, and a message of arbitrary length, much like a hash function. And it outputs a fixed size MAC value, much like the uh, hash function does. That's also known as a tag. And a cryptographic hash function is one method um, to, to generate a MAC value. Uh, HMAC SHA-256 uh, through a request for, I can't remember what the C stands for now, request for comment. Is that what it is, 2104? Uh, these are, this is well documented, and you should be able to find that one out on, um, out on the NIST site under the FIP specifications. And this one is, uh, these, including that one, are often used for authentication, and we'll uh, see how that works here coming up in a few moments. So here's an example of the usage of a Mac. <laughs> Very handy. So here we are concerned about the authenticity. Did this message that Alice received really come from Bob? And integrity. Has the message modified in transit in any way? Well, it was traveling across this insecure channel. So previously, Alice and Bob, maybe using Diffie-Hellman, have established a shared private key. So Bob takes his message, combines it with the, uh, his, uh, the shared uh, secret uh, private key that they both have, and runs it through the Mac algorithm to produce a tag. And the tag is sent across the channel. And the message in this case, in this particular example, isn't encrypted. Um, we're just worried about the authenticity and the integrity of the message. And so we don't, in this particular scenario, we don't care if Eve is listening in on the conversation or not. Uh, Alice and Bob don't care in this case. So the message is sent across clear text. So what Alice does on her side is she takes the message um, along with the private key and generates a, a new tag and takes the receive tag and compares those. And if they're the same, and Alice can trust that the message came from Bob. If the Eve got in the way here and modified this message, it would have changed the tag value. So you can check the message's integrity and the message's authentic authenticity. Open source downloads. I'm always a little nervous about downloading open source code because you don't ever really <laughs> know for 100% unless you know friends of the developers or something. I've downloaded some over the years and uh, many come with an MD5 checksum and MD5 is a utility in, the, in Linux land. So you go to the website, there's some executable code or some source code you can download and compile on your machine and they'll provide, maybe it's in a zip file and they'll provide an MD5 checksum now assuming that the website hasn't been hacked and the source code has been contaminated and they updated the new MD5 che checksum. <laughs> Um, assuming that hasn't happened, you can use the MD5 um, checksum to see if the zip file was modified as it was being downloaded. So vulnerabilities have been discovered in MD5 that make it unsuitable for use as a cryptographic hash function but can still be used for data integrity. 
has anyone mess with my zip file? 